house and the appearances are as before, uh, other than the jury is not in the room. And uh, it was reported to me that by Lieutenant Zerline that uh, this morning, Lieutenant Zerline, that this morning uh, at the pickup, uh, there was someone there and was video recording the jury, which uh, the officers approached the person and required him to, him, her, I didn't even ask, to um, delete the video and return the phone to him. Um, I've instructed that if it happens again there to take the phone and bring it here. So that's for your information. Um, Number two, unless there's some request, I'm not going to address anything further about uh, our conversation of yesterday at the close and uh, later. And then, um, Has that person been showing up before, Your Honor? The person who was being you know, I don't know the answer to that. You could talk to the lieutenant okay. when you get a chance. And then, um, I, uh, for the reasons stated in the brief which was filed by Mr. Krause, the motion for reconsideration on count six is denied. All right, anything else? We were talking about exhibits that hadn't been moved that I think the parties are in agreement to. Okay. So, so uh, 64, 65, 66, 67, 76, and 77 um, are ones that are agreed upon. The only one that is not agreed upon at this point is 69, which is the statement, uh, the written statement by the officer regarding Gage Grosskreutz that we, that I had questioned him about yesterday. I had marked and I would move that and I think the state has an objection to that statement. All right. Um, Mr. Mayor. Your Honor, the statement was used to impeach the witness. Um, I think some courts do things a little differently. I'm not. I don't recall off the top of my head. Sometimes those aren't marked as exhibits. Other times they're marked but not um, uh, admitted into evidence. Um, at the bottom line, Your Honor, is I don't think the jury should see it. So uh, as long as we don't show it to the jury, because I, it was only used for impeachment, I don't have any strong objection to how we handle it. Um, I think, generally speaking, things that are used for impeachment are not admitted to evidence. It may be marked as an exhibit, but not admitted to evidence. So that's that's where I'm at on that. Uh, did you want to say anything further? Uh, Judge, I, it was referred to. I wouldn't ask that it go back because the entire at this point the entire document had not been uh, read. But I think based on the way it was used yesterday, it would be appropriate to make it part of the record. So uh, I'm going to uh, receive it for. Uh It'll be received as evidence, uh, but however, those portions which were not directly quoted in the uh, examination um, will not be argued, nor will they, because they, that part is not in evidence, and um, the exhibit will not go, certainly not in the, its original form, to the jury room. Okay. While we're cleaning up uh, exhibits, Your Honor, if I, if I may. Uh, exhibit number three, I think, has also been marked as exhibit number 57. That's uh, the Gross Kreutz live stream, and I double marked that by mistake. Um, but I would move both of those. They're identical uh, in evidence. Any objection on that? Any objection? Received. Yesterday, I also used exhibit 10, which is Ford Fisher News to Share. Um, I thought I had moved it. Uh, according to the court's list here, it's not uh, been admitted yet, so I would move that in. Objection? Nope. Received. We also used the Crime Lab Ballistics Report, Exhibit 23, with Heather Williams. So we put that into evidence. What was the number? 23. 23. Objection. Yeah, no, I have no objection to it. Being received. received. That's all we have right now. Thank you. All right. And ready to go then? I'm calling the jury. Hello. Would you come down, please? Yes.
Um, you're aware, of course, of the incident at the bus pickup this morning, and I've been assured that the officers uh, had the uh, the video which had been taken is has been deleted, and new procedures are being instituted uh, so that something if something like that is uh, something like that sh should not recur. I'm frankly quite surprised that it did, uh, and. Um, that we have different procedures to do with respect to if it would occur. So I'm not, I, I don't have any particular concern about it. And we're very sensitive to this entire issue and uh, are, on, are on guard about it. Thank you. All right, Mr. Binger. Uh, Judge, uh, the state uh, will be calling James Armstrong to the stand. Mr. Armstrong, can you please uh, state your first name and spell it for the benefit of the court reporter? James Armstrong, J A M E S A R M A R M S T R N G. And Mr. Armstrong, how are you employed? I'm a senior forensic imaging specialist with the Wisconsin State Crime Lab in Milwaukee. And what do you do as a forensic imaging specialist senior? We handle a variety of internal and external requests. Internally, we handle a lot of photography of evidence fingerprints and footwear. Sure. We handle <clears throat> in the uh, within the forensic imaging unit. We handle a variety of internal and external requests. This includes photographing fingerprints and footwear, along with uh, also doing forensic video analysis as well. What is forensic video analysis? So examination of video uh, pertaining to legal matters. And what is your educational background? I have a Bachelor's of Fine Art in Photography from Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. And uh, have you worked in photography or anything else in your past? Yes. Uh, before coming to the Crime Lab, I worked in commercial photography for 14 years. Is your Crime Lab accredited? Our Crime Lab is cr accredited. And when you do some sort of forensic imaging, is there any kind of peer review process or anything that is done uh, to check your work? Yes, all the work that we do uh, within forensic imaging is tech reviewed by another qualified analyst and it's also administrative re reviewed as well. So when you're doing forensic imaging, does that include things like obtaining stills, zooming in, what kind of things do you do if you're uh, forensically looking at a piece of video? Yes, uh, it, it requires us to examine the video, uh, note any limitations of that video, and then provide any clarifications uh, of that video if requested. And have you been asked in this case uh, to look at any video or other uh, photography evidence? Yes, I've been requested to look at uh, different video uh, that's been submitted to the lab. I would ask that Exhibit 24 be put on the screens. what has been previously marked as States Exhibit 24. Uh, you look at either screen, is, which other screen is more comfortable. Uh, does that look familiar to you? Yes, it does. And what is that? Those are three clarified images that I produced um, from the, I'm sorry, that I produced from item U, uh, from video file that was submitted as item U. So a video, video file was submitted uh, by me and you found an image and you clarified it. That is correct. How do you go about doing that? I utilize uh, a variety of software. In this particular case, I used Ant5 to uh, enhance and clarify that image. Now, is it your job to figure out what is in the image, or are you just providing 
or attempting to provide more clear or uh, viewable images. In this particular case, the request was just to clarify uh, the item of interest in this video. If I could have uh, exhibit 25, please. Mr. Armstrong, I'm showing you what has previously been marked as State's Exhibit 25. Uh, do you recognize that? Yes, this appears to be the video that I annotated uh, as part of a request. What do you mean by annotated? I added the square box and the labeling uh, to this video. And is it your job to actually say who is who in the video? Or are you just pointing out people of interest that you've been designated to you? I'm just pointing people, just pointing out people as designated. Um, and how did you go about making this exhibit? Uh, to make this exhibit, uh, we load the video file into M5, and then I essentially uh, draw on that individual uh, frames as it goes through, and then output a video. Can we play exhibit 25, please? So you annotated it all throughout that portion of the video? That is correct, yes. Did you enhance or clarify or do anything else in the video or just simply annotate what was given to you as a raw video? I just simply annotated that video. Let's uh, show you what marked and previously entered as States Exhibit 26. Objection. I'm asking for the, oh, this has already been entered. I, I heard it edited as, States Exhibit 26, okay. 26. Mr. Armstrong, do you recognize this? Yes, I do. And what is this? This is another annotated video with an arrow. And did you create this video as well? I did, yes. Similar to the last video, did you simply annotate it? You didn't change anything about the video? That is correct, yes. Uh, I'd like you to please just briefly play Exhibit 26. Now, again, is that someone you've identified or someone that was designated to you to mark? That is someone that was designated uh, to me to mark. Mr. Armstrong, in this case, were you ever given a video and asked to get still shots of a snippet of a video? Yes, I was. And are you aware if that is the BG on the scene video, do you recall? I do not exactly recall um, with regards to that video, no. Uh, but fair to say that we asked you to look at a, a short segment and produce every still image that you could? Yes, that is correct. And were you able to do that of this video? Yes, that is correct. And do you know how many stills that you received from that video? 729 stills. And this morning before we came over here, did you view a folder that had those stills in the, uh, from the video? Uh, yes, I did. Um, at this part, I'd like to mark uh, and move a folder named Frames, uh, which is States Exhibit 80. Um, I'd like to uh, move that into evidence. Objection. No objection, Your Honor. Proceed. If I could have the next uh, video exhibit, 81.
Mr. Armstrong, in addition to those uh, videos that you've already mentioned, have you recently done any more forensic imaging work in this case? Yes, I was provided another video file um, as item X. And what did you do with item X? With item X, I enhanced and uh, enlarged the video file and cropped it to the area of interest. I'd like to show you what is marked as States Exhibit 81. Do you recognize this? Yes, that appears to be the videos, uh, clarified video that I uh, exported. Now, did you have any difficulties clarifying or tracking this file? Uh, the, the limitations of this file include the movement of the camera, um, movement of the person, and the lighting conditions that are present. Now, you mentioned limitations. Did all these various videos you looked at have different limitations? Yes, each had their own set of limitations. Um, I'd like you to, is this, uh, I know we watched, did we watch this video this morning? I believe so, yes. And is it a true and accurate copy of the uh, exhibit that you created of that drone video? It appears to be so, yes. I'd like to move exhibit 81 into evidence and play it for the jury. No objection. Go ahead. I can have exhibit 82, please. Mr. Armstrong, do you recognize this? Yes, I do. What is this? This is a video, again, clarified um, and cropped into the area of interest, and this video is slowed down by 50%. And is it a true and accurate copy of the video that uh, you've created for this exhibit? It appears to be, yes. Uh, please, uh, I'd like to move Exhibit 82 into evidence and publish it to the jury. No objection. Mr. Armstrong, did I give you a specific area to sort of focus in on in this video? Yes, you instructed that I look at the area near the sign, near some vehicles, and then as the uh, person uh, enters into the parking lot. Were you able to zoom in tight on that area? Not, not beyond what has been provided, no. Uh, can you go back to Exhibit 81? Mr. Armstrong, let's give you this pointer. And if you could stop, please, toward the beginning. If you could please point out, just stand up and point out the area of interest that I asked you to focus in on. So behind that, there's a black vehicle there. It would be the, the rear of that black vehicle. Can we play Exhibit 81 again? And Exhibit 82, please. Again, Mr. Armstrong, could you point out uh, the area of interest in this video that I asked you to uh, zoom in on? Again, it's to the rear of that black vehicle. We've been calling it the Duramax in this trial. Yes. Oh, the front of the vehicle, I apologize. But near that vehicle, the Duramax? Yes, that is correct. Uh, could you play exhibit 82, please?
Yeah, you may sit down. Thank you. Last year is marked as States Exhibit 83. Do you recognize this? Yes, it appears to be the video uh, that's been uh, clarified and then enlarged as well. And uh, is this a different part of that same drone video? Yes, this is a different uh, segment uh, picking up from the stopping point of the previous video and continue on to where the video, uh, uh, the camera view turns away from the area of interest. Um, is a true and accurate copy of the exhibit that you created? It appears to be so, yes. Could you, uh, I'd like to move exhibit 83 into ev evidence and publish it to the jury? No, no objection, Your Honor. If I could uh, ask for exhibit 84, please. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, what is this? Uh, this is the same segment, uh, except it's slowed down by 50%. So everything else is the same, it's just slowed down by half? That is correct. Let's move exhibit 84. Did you say 50% or 60? Uh, 50%, Your Honor. Uh, Luther moves to be 84 in evidence and publishes to the jury. No. Received. Now, I'd like to ask for State's Exhibit 85. And Mr. Armstrong, what is this? This is a, another clarified and enlarged video um, showing from approximately the 15 second mark until uh, the where the camera turns, turns away from the area of interest. And is it a true and accurate copy of the video that you produced for this exhibit? It appears to be so. I'd like to move exhibit 85 into evidence and uh, publish it to the jury. No objection. Proceed. Exhibit 86, please. Well, that's being pulled up, Mr. Armstrong. There was no sound in any of these videos, were there? I did not observe any sound with these videos, no. And if I could just direct your attention to number 86, do you recognize that? Uh, yes, that's the same as the previous file. Uh, the only difference being, again, is that it, it is slowed down by 50%. Uh, I'd like to move exhibit 86 into evidence and play it for the jury. No objection. Proceed.
Okay, uh, I have no further questions. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. The exhibits we, we've just shown the jury, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, and 86, correct me if I'm wrong, but you began working on putting them together on Friday. I began working on them on Sunday. Okay. When did the crime lab receive them? The crime lab received that as a submittal on Sunday. Okay. And who submitted them to you? It was ADA Jim Cross. Okay. And you're familiar with the fact that we didn't receive these videos until Friday of last week? I was informed that that was the circumstance, yes. Okay. And when you do this, you're not adding color, correct? That is correct. I'm not adding color. You're not adding pixels? It, with regards to enlargement, there is interpolation, and so pixels are added to that. Okay. How is the colors not changed? Color is not changed. So if you blow something up 10%, what does that do for the pixel number? The pixels will increase um, by interpolation of that, of that um, area. Okay. And what was the resolution of the source video for 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, and is it 86? I would need to refer to my notes in order to be able to confirm that. Please do, sir. The resolution for that file, it was 1920 by 844. And in layman's terms, what is that? Uh, that's 1,920 pixels by 844 pixels. Okay. And that's kind of tells you the clarity. The more pixels, the clearer it is. The more pixels, the higher resolution, there's more information present. Okay. And when, if you have to look at your notes, that's fine. Videos are done at, at certain speeds, so certain um, videos, whether it's a phone or whether it's a camera, they do it by frames per second. That is correct. The more frames per second, the clearer it is. Not necessarily, no. Okay. This one, how many frames per second, sir? This frame, uh, this video is 30 frames per second. 30. 30 or three? Three zero. So every one second, 30 different frames. That is correct. And you can use how many frames go by to time certain things, correct? You can, yes. Okay. You can use different videos if you can find a common event, such as a sound, to sync up videos to tell a whole story, correct? That would be uh, starting to move outside my area of expertise with that. Okay. But you're familiar that it can be done, correct? I'm familiar that it can be done. Okay. And what is that called, if you know? I do not know. Okay. And you can take different videos from different source sources, excuse me, linking them through a common event sometimes, sound, putting them together for a whole compilation. Um, with regards to audio, that's outside the scope of my expertise. Okay. And you can also do it from events on the video if they have a common event, not audio, but a common event. Um, it depends on the video in, in question. Okay. And in this case, when you put the marks person of interest, who told you to do that? Uh, that was provided by the requester, ADA Jim Cross. Because you don't know anything about these videos when you get them or anything about the case. You're just told, we think this person's important. We want them followed. That is correct. Okay. And in your case, I think you used yellow arrow arrows? I did, yes. Okay. I have nothing further. Thank you. Any redirect? No, thank you. You may step down, sir. Seagull, Dr. Kelly, do you see it?
with your right hand. Do you sign me swear the testimony about to give this matter, be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. You may be seated. Doctor, could you please state your name and spell them for the benefit of the court reporter? My name is Doug Kelly, D-O-U-G-K-E-L-L-E-Y. And are you a doctor? I am. And what kind of doctor are you? Uh, I'm a forensic pathologist. What is a forensic pathologist? Well, pathology is uh, the field of medicine that involves the study of disease and trauma in the human body. Uh, forensic pathology is a subspecialty of that which uh, specifically involves the principles of medic medicine and science as they apply to the law. So as a forensic pathologist, we're concerned with determining the cause and manner of death in people. And uh, uh, typically, we act as uh, medical examiners in medical examiner's offices. So we'll uh, look at those uh, issues in people who fall within our jurisdiction. And you, where do you work now? Uh, the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office. And are you aware that the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner does handle the forensic pathology for Kenosha County? That's correct. What is your educational background? I graduated from Illinois Wesleyan University in, 1990, in 1988, sorry, and uh, then went to medical school at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine in Springfield, Illinois. I graduated in 1992. Um, I uh, was in internal medicine residency from uh, 1992 to 94 and decided to be a forensic pathologist. Uh, my forensic pathology training in pathology is uh, with St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, I completed that in 1998. Uh, I then came to Wisconsin and did my forensic pathology fellowship with the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office, completing that in uh, the summer of 1999 and then uh, stayed on as a staff member after that. And have you worked as a forensic pathologist or a associate medical examiner or something in that capacity since then? Yes, I have. Do you have an idea of how many autopsies you've performed? Uh, I'm at or a bit above 6,000 at this point in my career. Now, are those all homicides or are those all different kinds of deaths? Oh, no, those are all kinds of different deaths. Um, so homicides are only a part of what we, uh, uh, what we in investigate. Now, did you become involved with the autopsies of Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber? Yes. I would like to show you what has been marked as State's Exhibit 20. This is uh, a copy of my signed autopsy report on Joseph Rosenbaum. And is it true and accurate to the best of your knowledge of copy of your report? Yes, it appears to be. I'd like to move exhibit 20 into evidence. No Sir, I'd ask, doctor, I'm sorry, if I'd ask you to put that down and look, yeah, let's look at the other exhibit there, which has been marked as state's exhibit 21. Okay, Exhibit 21 is a uh, copy of my signed autopsy report on Anthony Huber. Uh, it also includes uh, the two-page uh, toxicology report from our toxicology laboratory. Is that a true and accurate copy of the uh, exhibit or of your, of your report? Yes, it is. Let's like move Exhibit 21 into evidence. Objection. Doctor, do you hold uh, any board certifications? I'm board certified in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, and in forensic pathology. And do you hold a medical license? Yes, in the state of Wisconsin. Are there any professional organizations with, to which you belong? Uh, I belong to the National Association of Medical Examiners, to the uh, American Academy of Forensic Science, uh, to the Wisconsin Corners and Medical Examiners Association. 
Now, Doctor, I'd like to uh, focus on uh, Mr. Huber first. Uh, do you recall when you did the autopsy on Mr. Huber? Yeah, the autopsy on Mr. Huber was done on the morning of August 26th of 2020. And that would be the day of or the morning after that he deceased? That was the same morning that he was pronounced deceased, yes. Now, how is a body brought to you up in Milwaukee? Um, we, uh, when someone is brought to us, uh, our investigators uh, admit them uh, to the uh, to the facility. They are given a you can unique identifier. Um, they are uh, then basically stored in refrigeration until we uh, have the opportunity to perform an examination on them. Uh, in this case, you were able to do an examination on Mr. Huber fairly quickly. Yes. And how do you begin? Let's ask it this way. How did you begin your examination of Mr. Huber? Uh, well, an autopsy examination, uh, uh, it, it consists of many components, but the first thing that we do, or the first thing that I do, when somebody comes to me is I look at them as is. I uh, will look at them, uh, take photographs, collect any evidence that I find, and, uh, uh, and then we'll remove any clothing or uh, anything else from the body. Uh, again, examining the body, collecting any evidence I find, taking photographs, doing what's necessary. Um, uh, those photos are taken before anything is cleaned up, and so that's the next step is to clean everything up, any fluids that are on the surface of the body, any dirt. Um, and then again, same process, looking, looking at the body uh, again. Um, the uh, f final thing that we, we, we do is uh, um, uh, do the internal examination, which is really what I think more people are familiar with when they think of a, an autopsy. We make incisions and that allow us to look at the organs and tissues. And again, we are looking for any evidence of, of trauma, any evidence of disease. We're collecting evidence as necessary, uh, specimens for toxicology, taking photographs. And in the end, uh, we put together all of this information uh, from the uh, external and internal examination to determine the cause of death. And were you able to determine the cause of death to Mr. Huber? Yes. And what was that cause of death? Uh, Mr. Huber died from a gunshot wound to the chest. And is that an opinion given to with a reasonable degree of medical certainty? It is. And uh, what can you tell us about this gunshot wound? Uh, so Mr. Huber has an entrance wound uh, that is just below the left nipple. Um, it uh, basically travels through his chest and creates trauma to both of the lungs and, and specifically to the heart. There's a lot of, of damage to the heart. Uh, so he has a, a large amount of, of blood within his body cavities, his chest cavities. And the, uh, the projectile didn't exit. There's actually a, a bruise and with some sc scraping off to the surface. And it's located to the right shoulder just beneath the collarbone. And in that location, I collected a, a, a bullet fragment. Um, so this, uh, this is the single gunshot wound. And it uh, created lethal injury involving the heart and lungs. Now, why would that gunshot wound have been lethal? What, what would have killed Mr. Huber? Uh, the, the trauma to the heart and lungs is pretty extensive from this, uh, from this wound. Uh, so he, uh, he bled from the wounds that were created by the gunshot. Did you find any blood uh, inside of his body? Uh, yes, he, he had blood within both of his chest cavities. Uh, and do you recall how much blood? Uh, he had about 1,200 milliliters of blood or over a liter of blood to the left chest cavity and he had two liters of blood to the right chest cavity. So to the best of your knowledge, would it have been the loss of blood that caused death or the damage to the organs or a combination of both? A combination of both. Now what was the traje trajectory of the bullet or the wound path? Uh, this, this wound path had a trajectory that was left to right and upwards. Now, when you're talking about trajectory, what are you relating it to? Uh, well, in, in, in order to have a, a, a standard set of criteria to, 
to be able to discuss trajectories, we put the body in something we call anatomic position. And simply put, the anatomic position is with the person standing straight up with the palms forward. So the person's left is left, the person's right is right, superior and inferior, up and down, and front and back are relative to that person. So it's that simple. We're just creating a standard position that we can, uh, that, that we can relate to. So Dr. Riley demonstrating the anatomic position right now? That's correct. So even if I was, let's say, uh, shot in my uh, stomach area from someone on the ground, the shot went up, I'm sorry, let me, let me reverse that. Um, so no matter where I was shot, it would matter the bullet, how it traveled from my head to toes and from my left to my right. Correct. Were there any other notable injuries or findings on Mr. Huber? Um, Mr. Huber had some some little abrasions or scrapes here and there, and um, he had a, a good sized abrasion or scrape to his right thumb, and he had some uh, abrasions or scrapes to his knees and and to the inside of his elbows, a uh, little abrasion or scrape to the lower back. Um, when I did his internal examination, he did have a little area of, of hemorrhage to the, the left side of his, his scalp, uh, the deep scalp, uh, and, um, uh, but no injuries to the skull or to the brain itself. So the other injuries were minor injuries, scrapes, and, and little bruises, but nothing of significance. Is there any way to tell if they were a part of this gunshot incident, or could they have been pre-existing injuries? No, the, these, uh, these injuries could have been pre-existing injuries, and uh, there's no way to age a, uh, a bruise or a, or a scrape to any accuracy, so uh, all I can say that those, were in, those injuries were present. I'll let you as a to state's exhibit 87. Hopefully the monitors have remained on. Uh, doctor, let's see what's in marked as State's Exhibit 87. Do you recognize that? Oh, I'm sorry, I guess this isn't on. One second, please. Doctor, let's see what's in marked as State's Exhibit 87. Do you recognize that? I do. And what is that? Um, well, this is, this is the entrance wound. It's uh, not clear in this photo because it appears that this photo is the one with the, uh, uh, there is a, uh, a, a patch over it which was placed uh, during resuscitation. There's a, uh, a, that looks, it's kind of a plastic gel-like patch that is placed over wounds to try to contain bleeding. And so that's over the wound, so you can't really see the, the entrance wound very well in this particular photo. Now, where is that wound? Uh, well, you can you can you can see it. You can see the hemorrhage uh, there in the middle. It's it's red. Which, I mean, I'm sorry. I should ask that better. Where in the body is that wound? Oh, this is so. This is the wound to the left side of the chest. It's just under the uh, the nipple. I'd like to move exhibit 87 into evidence. No objection. Okay. If I could have the next exhibit, please, exhibit 88. Now, uh, doctor, what are we looking at in Exhibit 88? So this is a, uh, this looks like a photograph um, that shows his face and upper chest. What you're looking at there to the, uh, the, the purple area to his right shoulder, that's the location of the bullet. The bullet is underneath the skin in that location. So it's right below the collarbone. Uh, there are a few markings on him. Can you take that pointer that uh, is in front of you there and point out this purplish area you're speaking of. There should be a wooden pointer right in front of the, uh, nope. 
I'm sorry, in front of the, on the table in front of you, I'm sorry. An old fashioned wooden pointer. Oh. Looks like a Thank you. <laughs> and so, do I understand your testimony? That's where you found the bullet? Yes. But it was still inside of Mr. Huber? Yes, this bullet was underneath the skin, right underneath that, that bruise. For, if not already done, I'd like to move this into evidence. Uh, the next exhibit, please. This is State's Exhibit 89. Uh, do you recognize this, sir? Yes, this is another another photo of his. You can see his torso and his uh, uh, lower part of his face to the left of the photo. The white things on his body are defibrillator pads, so this is from resuscitation. Again, you can see the, the two wounds that we that we just showed. You can see the, the purple injury to his right shoulder and you can see the uh, red area of hemorrhage surrounding the entrance wound, uh, which is to his left side of his chest. It's, again, it's covered by a, uh, a, a patch that's uh, meant to contain hemorrhage. So doctor, if you just could, could you please on that screen, uh, to the best of your uh, knowledge, trace what the path of the bullet would have been given those two injuries? Sure. So it would have entered uh, by his, on his left chest and then traveled uh, to his right shoulder. Yes. That's accurate? That's accurate. You may, you may have a seat. Thank you, doctor. That was about 89 into evidence. Now I'd like to move on to Mr. Rosenbaum. I believe you also did the autopsy with Mr. Rosenbaum. Yes, I did. Do you recall if these came in at the same time or if you did one first or do you have any recollection of that? Uh, I don't have a rec recollection of that. Mr. Rosenbaum, uh, his examination was performed uh, the following day. It was performed on August 27th of 2020. And did you do the same procedure that you described Mr. Huber in terms of taking photographs and initial appearances and then cleaning and then doing a further examination? Same procedure. Uh, is there anything different about how Mr. Rosenbaum uh, came to you or appeared to you? Uh, when Mr. Rosenbaum uh, came to the office, his uh, uh, clothing had been had been removed. He had been to the hospital and his clothing had been removed, um, whereas Mr. Huber came with his clothing still still on. Um, but aside from that, I, I don't think, uh, oh, well, and then the other thing was that uh, Mr. Rosenbaum came with the hands covered by paper bags to protect possible evidence. But uh, other than those things, I think that uh, I don't think there was anything else. So what did you first notice about Mr. Uh, Rosenbaum? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Rosenbaum uh, had uh, several injuries that uh, were related to gunshot wounds. Um, that's, that's what I noticed initially, yes. And did you perform any x-rays on, or any other imaging on Mr. Huber or Mr. Rosenbaum? Yes, x-rays are uh, taken prior to the autopsy examination. That allows us to look for skeletal injuries as well as to locate any projectiles or projectile fragments, bullets or bullet fragments. Were you able to come to a conclusion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty on the what caused the death of Mr. Rosenbaum? Yes. What was that? Uh, Mr. Rosenbaum died from multiple gunshot wounds. And uh, in his physical examination, was there anything of note that would have led to a questioning or a uh, addition to that cause of death? Uh, no. Do you know how many gunshot wounds Mr. that you found on Mr. Rosenbaum? 
Uh, well, Mr. Rosenbaum has a number of injuries. Um, there are um, uh, two injuries in which uh, the bullet entered the body and did not exit, so I collected bullets from those injuries. There's a third injury that is a graze wound in which the bullet just grazed the skin superficially. And then there is uh, a, uh, a gunshot wound to the left hand and an area to the left thigh that appear to uh, be separate but may actually be, um, I, I think they're related uh, to the same uh, gunshot wound. Now, before we get too far into this, what is stippling? Um, okay, so I think to explain that I have to back up one step and just uh, remind you that more than just the bullet comes out of the end of the gun. Uh, so uh, flame comes out of the gun, smoke and soot comes out of the gun, unburned gunpowder particles come out of the end of the gun, and of course then the bullet comes out. Um, what we do in forensic pathology is we look for injuries on the body or evidence on the body that allows us to estimate the distance of the muzzle of the gun to the surface of the body. And so in, in contact wounds, we might actually see a, scrapes around the entrance site uh, from the muzzle of the gun, from the skin actually hitting the muzzle of the gun. It's called a muzzle stamp, so that's a contact wound. Um, uh, out to a certain distance, soot will actually be able to deposit on the skin. It's obviously not very aerodynamic, so after about a foot or so, soot is, is imperceptible. But and it depends on the weapon uh, to how far that can be seen. Um, but soot will tell us that the muzzle of the gun is within a, a pretty close distance. And then the gunpowder that comes out, those little gunpowder particles, they also have uh, a velocity to them, so they have energy. So they have kinetic energy that can cause damage to the surface of the skin. So when they hit the skin, if they have enough energy, they can actually cause little scrapes. And those little scrapes or abrasions are little punctate, little round punctate or small elongated injuries to the skin that surround the perforation. And of course, the closer you are, the more dense it is, and as they, as they travel through the, through the air, they spread out and create a, a wider and less dense pattern around the injury to, until a point where you can't see them anymore. They don't have enough injury, uh, uh, energy to create an injury on the surface of the skin. That is called gunpowder stippling. So when the gunpowder creates an injury to the skin, we call that gunpowder stippling and that indicates an intermediate range gunshot wound. Um, so that's just one of the things that we use to estimate the distance of the muzzle from the, the surface of the body. And then everything else is referred to as indeterminate because we, we, uh, we, we can't tell. We don't use the word distance. Um, we use the word indeterminate because we can't see anything. Uh, that doesn't mean that something didn't get in the way or filter out the gunpowder particles in the soot. So we just say anything without any evidence of, uh, of gunpowder stippling or soot around a, a wound is indeterminate. So when you talk about gunpowder stippling, we're talking about an intermediate range gunshot wound. Uh, you, there's a term I see in your report uh, called pseudo stippling. What is pseudo stippling? Um, Obviously, anything that hits the skin and leaves a, uh, an abrasion um, will you know, leave a mark that we will make note of. Uh, if something other than gunpowder hits the surface of the skin and creates those abrasions, we'll often refer to, we'll refer to those as pseudo, pseudo stippling. And so if the bullet goes through an intermediate target, so if it goes through uh, another body part, if it goes through a window, if it goes through a door, the uh, particles of those surfaces uh, might actually travel with some force downstream and hit the surface of the body, creating those same types of injuries. But those look very different than gunpowder stippling. They're, they vary in size and shape. They sometimes are irregular, some are small, some are big. 
Um, but that's called pseudo stippling, and that can be caused by a number of different things, as I just pointed out. It can also be caused by uh, a bullet ricocheting off of something, so it can break break up a surface and cause those particles of the bullet and particles of that surface to travel and hit the body. And so that is called pseudo stippling. It's not the same as gunpowder stippling. I'd like to first talk about a gunshot wound to the pelvis. Uh, what can you tell me about that gunshot wound? So Mr. Rosenbaum has a gunshot wound to the right side of the pelvis. Um, or actually, it's to the right side of the groin. And that gunshot wound passes uh, into, the, into the body and hits the pelvis, uh, creates a, 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 a quite bad fracture to the right side of the pelvis. And then that bullet continues, and there is an area of bruising to the right buttock. Um, there's actually a little, a, a, a little uh, perforation where the bullet couldn't quite get through. But in that location, under that uh, little incomplete exit, that's where I found the bullet from that gunshot wound. Um, so this gunshot wound actually um, uh, has some stippling, gunpowder stippling associated with it. Um, it's to the lower abdomen. And interestingly enough, where his waistline is at, there's no stippling below that point. So there, it's not surrounding this entrance wound. It's actually above to the abdomen. But it's because he's wearing the, the, the clothing, and the clothing didn't allow that gunpowder to get to the surface of the, uh, of the uh, body in the groin region. But it did in the lower abdomen. So we see that gunpowder stipping to the lower abdomen. It's associated with this entrance wound to the right groin. And that is an intermediate range gunshot wound. So what is intermediate range? Uh, as I said, intermediate range is, uh, in, it depends on the weapon and the, the, the uh, type of ammunition used. Uh, typically, typically, when you see gunpowder stippling, you're looking at uh, a muzzle to target distance of a few feet. Um, but again, it depends on whether you're talking about a handgun or rifle or, or such. Um, I would say that in this particular instance, we're talking about something uh, within a few feet, within four feet or so. And, and that's knowing that the defendant fired with an AR-15 rifle with 223 caliber ammunition? That's right. So you, you would, you'd estimate that, to, I just want to be, be clear, you're saying that he was about four feet away or he was within four feet? Uh, I'm saying that, that well, the best way of putting it is the only way to, to be more accurate is to test fire the weapon and uh, see what kind of a, a pattern you get because the density of that gunpowder stippling pattern might help you somewhat. But this is pretty spread out. Um, so it, all we can really say is that it's within a few feet, but I can't be any more specific. And what was the path of that gunshot wound? Uh, it's basically front to back and a little left to right. And in your medical opinion, is this the kind of shot that would have resulted in loss of life? Uh, it's not an immediately lethal wound, uh, no. Obviously, you know, all gunshot wounds can, can produce morbidity and, and mortality, but uh, in this particular instance, this is not an immediately lethal wound. Now, Doctor, I'd like to talk to you about a gunshot wound. Did you find any wounds to the hand? The left hand has a gunshot wound. Um, it's a very complex wound. There is tearing of the skin to the palmar surface at the base of the uh, index and middle fingers. There's a tear that extends up the middle finger, and there's actually some, uh, uh, a lot of soot to this area and tearing to the underlying soft tissues. Uh, that soot continues to the other fingers of the palmar surface of the hand. Um, 
this wound is associated with fracturing to the first bone of the index finger, so the bone just beyond the knuckle. That bone is fractured by this wound path. Uh, and then it exits uh, to the uh, back of the hand just, just beyond the, uh, the knuckle of the index finger. So if we were to put this into anatomic position, which we talked about a minute ago with the palm forward, this, the trajectory of this wound path with the hand in anatomic position is uh, basically front to back, right to left, and a little bit upwards. Did you recover any bullet fragments from that wound? Uh, no. You mentioned that, uh, was there any stippling or any indicate or soot or anything of that nature in this wound? Uh, this, with, this wound does have soot associated with it. There's a, a fair amount of soot to the, like I said, the palmar surface of, of that hand. Uh, so clearly this wound represents something closer, what I call a close range gunshot wound. And do you have any idea where that bullet would have went after it went through the hand? Um, it, uh, I think that it makes sense that this wound is associated with another wound that is to the, the lateral or the outside of the left thigh. Um, it's, it's kind of to the lower left thigh, but the, um, that area has a very irregular large area of abrasion and multiple small perforations. And in one of these perforations, I actually recovered a small fragment of a bullet. Um, the x-ray shows that there's additional very, very small um, uh, metal fragments in the, in the left thigh as well, which I, I didn't recover. Um, so this injury to the left, uh, outside of the left thigh, um, this is very characteristic of a, a ricochet type wound. In other words, I think the bullet hit something, ricocheted, breaking up the bullet and that surface, and that showered the, the, the left lateral thigh and created these injuries. Um, it appears that the, one, the gunshot wound that could have caused that would be the one related to the left hand as well. So I think that uh, the uh, gunshot wound to the left hand passed through made impact with the pavement and fragmented, fragmenting some of the pavement as well, and that this created the injury to the left thigh uh, as well as to the, the left hand. Now the hand injury, uh, would that, would you consider that to be an injury that would quickly cause death? No, that's not a lethal wound either. And this injury to the left thigh, is that, uh, is that the kind of injury that would cause death? No, it's not. Uh, would, it be, would it be fair to say that's something of a superficial wound? Yes. Now I'd like to talk to you about a gunshot wound to the head. What can you tell me about that? Well, to the right frontal area of the head. Um, so, so basically the right lateral forehead. Um, there is a graze wound, as I mentioned previously. So this is a superficial injury in which uh, the, the bullet grazed the, grazed the surface of the skin or created an abrasion or scrape. And based on the appearances of the edge of this, of this wound, it appears to be traveling in a back to front and downward orientation. Uh, and there's no, obviously no bullet or bullet fragments recovered from the, from the body on a, a wound like this. So when you're saying back to front, the injury, the bullet actually made contact towards the rear of the head first and then traveled towards the front of the head? It, yes, it's, it's, it's uh, the angle is sharply downwards, uh, so, but it's from back to front and, and downwards. Now, is that wound, would that be considered to be a wound that would be immediately fatal? No, it's not. 
Now, doctor, I'd like to talk to you about a uh, gunshot wound to the chest and the abdomen. What can you tell me about that gunshot wound? Well, this, this gunshot wound to Mr. Rosenbaum, it enters the back uh, about an inch to the left of the upper midline. Um, and this is the one that passes through the right chest cavity. Um, it uh, creates a great deal of injury to the right lung. Uh, there's blood within the right chest cavity. It then uh, perforates the, the diaphragm uh, at the base of the lung and enters the liver, which is right under the diaphragm, creates a great deal of injury to the liver. Um, uh, there's fracturing of several ribs in association with this wound path as well. But then the wound path, um, after creating all this injury, it passes into the right flank. And there was a, uh, a bruise to the right flank under which I collected a, uh, a bullet. Now, we've talked about how the other injuries were not ones that would immediately cause a mortal wound. Uh, what impact do you believe that this gunshot would have had on Mr. Rosenbaum? Uh, this gunshot wound is a lethal injury. And what do you mean by that? Uh, this uh, gunshot wound is the uh, uh, one that would cause um, death as a result of the injuries to the lungs and the liver with the hemorrhage and the uh, injury to the organs themselves. Is that to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes. Now, what was the trajectory of this gunshot wound? This gunshot wound is downward, left to right, and back to front. I'd like to pull up the next exhibit, please, on Mr. Rosenbaum. TVs are off. <coughs> While we're setting this up, Doctor, were you able to establish uh, the size of Mr. Rosenbaum during this autopsy? Uh, his height and weight, you mean? Yes. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he's five foot four inches tall and he weighed uh, 153 pounds. Doctor, let's show what's marked as uh, exhibit 90. What is this? You're looking at the graze wound to his head. Now, when you say it's back to front, how can you tell that? In order to determine that, you have to look at it very closely. You have to look at the edges. And typically, um, a projectile that uh, travels along the surface of the skin will create tearing of the skin. And the way that it tears the skin helps you to determine its direction. In this case, the the direction of the tears tells you the direction the bullet is going. So it kind of it kind of pushes through the tissue, tears it as it goes, and it's those specific tears as you go along that you can uh, use to determine this. So you indicated the trajectory of this bullet was uh, back to front and downwards, and that's in the anatomical position. That's correct. Um, I'd like to move Exhibit 90 into evidence. Steve. Next exhibit, please. Now, Doctor, I'd like to show you exhibit 91. Do you recognize this? Yes. What is that? What you're looking at is to the left side of the picture next to that scale um, with the numbers on it. That's the knee of the left leg. And right above the left knee, you're looking at the lateral left thigh and the injury is that area of scraping a red abrasion right above it. It's very irregular in its appearance. Now is this the injury that you've opined was caused by debris or by a bullet fragmenting? Yes, by, uh, by ricochet. And is there evidence of the pseudo stippling which you talked about? Um, you can you can see that in addition to the the main body of the uh, uh, abrasion, you can see some very small areas of, uh, of abrasions or scrapes 
there above it and below it. And those little areas are separate impact sites. Those are separate uh, projectiles, if you will. So this entire area is, uh, is, is a, an atypical wound. I'd like to move exhibit 91 in evidence. Exhibit 92, please. Uh, doctor, what is this? Uh, this is a picture before cleaning up. Uh, it's a picture of the palmar surface of the left hand. So this is where the injury to the left hand is located. And can you indicate, uh, if you can, where the entrance wound is? Um, so if you look at the, uh, the middle finger and to the right side of the middle finger, it's, it's really difficult to see in this particular photograph. But to the right side of the middle finger there, that's where the uh, beginning of the injury is at. That's where okay. the, the entrance is, so to speak. I, I apologize. Could you use that pointer and, and point it out? It is difficult to see. Stay there and we'll, we'll try to do it this way. Did everyone hear that? Now, there's some dark markings all over the hand. What is that? Let's move exhibit 92 into evidence. No objection. Proceed. Next exhibit, please. Uh, doctor, what are we looking at here? This is, this is a photograph that shows the exit wound from the left hand. So what you're looking at here is the index finger and the thumb, and this irregular area here, this round area, is the uh, exit point. Let's move exhibit 93 into evidence. Any objection? Can I have a number again? 93. No objection. Proceed. Now, and that is the exit wound that you believe would have then went and struck perhaps the pavement and caused the thigh injury? Let's see what is it marked as 94? Exhibit 94, do you recognize that? This is another photograph of the uh, palmar surface of the left hand. And again, you can see this is the rounded area here, uh, the beginning of the, of the wound path here, this tearing here. This is all the laceration or tearing that extends along the wound path. This black material here, 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 uh, you can see a little bit here too. All that black material is the soot, um, and the, the exit wound is going to be on the other side of the hand about right here. I'd like to move exhibit 94 in evidence. No objection. Proceed. Next please, exhibit 95. And doctor, what is this? bit better, you can see the injury to the middle finger here again. Uh, you can see the irregularity to it. You can see the black soot. Uh, you can see some soot up here as well. Uh, in the background, you can see the tearing. But this is basically showing the uh, injury to the uh, middle finger. What is, what is the white, the whiteness sort of in the middle of the finger? Are those bones or ligaments or what is that? 
Um, actually, to the index finger, you're probably seeing this it's, it's a little more red or pink, but um, there, you, you could see the ligament uh, to, the, uh, to the middle finger. The index finger, there was both exposed ligament and fragments of bone. That's where the fracture was at. I think we have a 95 in evidence. Next, please. Let's see what is marked as States Exhibit 96. Do you recognize that? Uh, yes. What is that? This is uh, a picture before it's cleaned up. This is a picture of the uh, um, entrance wound to the right groin region. Um, the genitalia would be in the upper right corner there uh, next to the uh, top of the scale. Um, there's a lot of blood on this, so it's, it's difficult to see things, but the entrance wound is right here. And, and what is the redness around the wound? Um, that's, that's all blood. There, so there's uh, wet and dry blood still to the surface of the body. This is before uh, he's been cleaned up and refloated back. Like to exhibit 96 in evidence? Doctor, what is this? This photograph uh, is a picture of Mr. Rosenbaum's back. Uh, you can see the entrance wound is this dark round injury here. Um, there is a pattern of gunpowder stippling to the left side of the back that extends around the, uh, the wound. So you can see it uh, with, uh, extending all the way from the back of the left shoulder down to the area around the entrance wound. Did you use a 97 in evidence? No objection. I see. Doctor, I looked at it, so you exhibit 98. What is this? This is a cleaned up photograph. Uh, so after the removal of uh, blood, this is a cleaned up photograph of the graze wound to the right side of the head. So this is after he, you've, that Mr. Rosenbaum has been washed or cleaned up? That's correct. Let's move to 98 in evidence. Objection. Uh, doctor, this is exhibit 99. What is this? Uh, this is a closer photograph of the uh, left hand showing the exit wound. What you're looking at is the thumb is here to the left. The index finger is underneath the scale. And this round area is the, uh, the exit wound. That's who's been 99 to evidence. Objection. Doctor, what are we looking at here? This is the injury to the left hand after it's been cleaned up somewhat. Uh, you can see here's the thumb, the index finger, the middle finger. This area along the middle finger is a ragged area with, which represents the beginning of the wound path described earlier, you can see the black areas here all along the uh, wound as well as to the adjacent uh, ring finger. That's all soot. You can see some of the soot here at the base of the index finger. And again, there's this laceration, this laceration that extends along the palmar surfaces of those two uh, fingers. This was at 100 in evidence. Doctor, what are we looking at here? This photograph depicts the, this is the knee right here in the middle. Um, this injury up here is that atypical injury to the lower uh, lateral left thigh. Uh, you can see the, the main body of the irregular abrasion. You can see the smaller uh, abrasion surrounding it. This right here 
to the left knee is an abrasion or scrape. So this is just a, a, a scrape of the left knee. And what relevance do you believe this has to this case? Um, it, it, it possibly could have happened when he went down to the ground or was on the ground. Exclusive 101 into evidence. And for the final exhibit, doctor, uh, what is this? This is a close-up photograph uh, after he's been cleaned up of the entrance gunshot wound to the right groin. I think exhibit 102 into evidence. Um, you may sit back down. Thank you, doctor. Now, as a medical examiner, uh, is all you do or all you're allowed to do is look at the body? Uh, no. Uh, what else can your uh, medical examiner, is it fair to say you perform an investigation? Uh, y yes, we, uh, we uh, collect information about the circumstances of the case. Um, we'll look at photographs, uh, scene photographs or other photographs, we'll look at video from scenes. We'll look at a lot of different things in order to uh, understand the circumstances better and perhaps help us to uh, answer other questions. And did you review anything else in this case that would aided you in your investigation in terms of Mr. Rosenbaum? Uh, several things were, were reviewed uh, for Mr. Rosenbaum, uh, specifically um, a, a video, YouTube video was referenced to uh, exemplify the, the, the circumstances of the, uh, uh, of the, the shooting. Um, I reviewed some uh, other records, medical records and things, which is routine, but, uh, but that, actually that was about it with Mr. Rosenbaum. Defense Exhibit 41. If you do, do you recognize this? Y yes. What is that? Um, I th th that appears to be the an, an introductory screen from a, a video that was referenced to me. Uh, I, I was told to look at this video for reference. Um, in understanding or in seeing the scene of the shooting better. And is that because it's the same video that Dr. Jensen, the defense expert, reviewed? Uh, yes, I, I believe so. And after watching that video, um, are you able to tell us anything about the first two gunshots? Um, the, if trying to uh, d determine some kind of order of gunshots, um, obviously the autopsy itself is, is, is not going to allow us to do that. We can use the injuries uh, and the, the, the details about those injuries to help us, but um, the autopsy alone is not going to uh, to allow you to, to, to do that. And also is not going to allow you to know what position the person is in when they were, when they were shot. Um, you know, we put things in, in terms of anatomic position, but uh, we seldom know exactly what position they were in when, they, uh, when the gunshot wound was incurred. So the use of the video can sometimes be uh, uh, helpful 
in answering those questions. And really with regards to the video, uh, and there really was only one very small uh, uh, portion of that entire video that um, uh, helps me. And I think that uh, it's the uh, uh, portion where there's actually some sound so I can, I can hear the gunshots uh, and see the position of Mr. Rosenbaum at that time that you hear the discharge of the, of the weapon. Um, and so that's what, I, that's what I use the video for, is mainly to just to see what position he was in when I hear those gunshots. And so really um, knowing that he had, he had these, these gunshot wounds uh, to different areas, he's got an entrance wound to the, to the front of his body, the, the right groin, he's got an entrance wound to the upper back, he's got, an he's got a graze wound to the, to the head. And so in looking at the video and uh, paying attention to his body position when I heard the discharge of the weapon, I was at least able to say that the only time uh, during the interaction in which he could have incurred the gunshot wounds to the, uh, to the back and to the right side of the head is when he's more horizontal. And the only time that that happens is, is uh, the, the last two gunshot wounds. So I think the first two gunshot wounds are represented by the, um, uh, the, the, the injury to the groin and the injury to the left thigh. Um, there is a, um, uh, it's, it's not the, the greatest video for, uh, um, not the clearest video, but um, right after the second gunshot wound, there's also some kind of a, a cloud, uh, it, it seems. There's some kind of a cloud of smoke or something like that. And uh, I, I felt this was consistent with a, uh, a bullet hitting the pavement and creating that cloud, and therefore that would, uh, would be related to the uh, injury to the left thigh. Uh, so really that's how I uh, use the, the, the video, just to uh, determine when he's in position to receive um, um, certain gunshot wounds. So doctor, is your testimony that in the video you reviewed, uh, which the jury has seen, uh, you, the, the first gunshots are while Mr. Rosenbaum is facing Mr. Rittenhouse? Yes. And you said that at least one of those was intermediate out to four feet away? Uh, yes. And then uh, you see in the video that uh, Mr. Rosenbaum continues going forward and he begins to uh, tilt or fall and is it your opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty that the back to front shots to the head and then the kill shot to the back would have been while he was falling or perpendicular to the ground? Uh, the, the only way that the uh, trajectories of the gunshot wounds to the right side of the head and the back make sense is if he's more horizontal to the ground and that is occurring um, at the time that the last two gunshot wounds are heard on the video. Doctor, in your uh, to the best of your medical knowledge and opinion, um, if an individual is moving forward and they sustain that injury uh, that entered by the groin and went to the hip, uh, could that cause them to fold forward and kind of move forward or move down in a downward position? Uh, th that's possible. There is a, um, a, a very complex fracture involving the right side of the pelvis, which um, uh, may make the, the pelvis and the right leg more unstable, but uh, all I can say is that that's a possibility. Anything else? <clears throat> Doctor, we talked about this hand wound and where and how that occurred. Um, if someone is pointing a rifle at you, an AR-15, do you have an explanation of how that hand could be positioned that would result in the injury shown and then also uh, perhaps the injury to the thigh from that same round? Well, as I said, this is a, a close range injury um, and uh, so his hand is in close proximity or in contact with the end of that rifle. Um, so 
you can you can kind of think of it in your in your head. You know, if you put if you put the end of the rifle close to that trajectory through his hand, um, you move the hand around. That's you can put it in different uh, relationships to the body that uh, can explain that. Uh, typically, by turning the palm towards the ground, it would make make uh, sense that it could uh, go through the hand, hit the ground, and then create the injuries to the uh, uh, the left side of the thigh. So it's consistent that the hand with the palm was to the ground, and then it would have entered by the middle finger, gone through, and then exited the end of the index finger, and then hit the ground? Yes. And just to be clear, uh, we've only heard four gunshots. Um, is it possible that the four gunshots caused all five wounds? Yes. I have nothing further. Thank you. Uh, let's take a break. Uh, please don't talk about the case during the break. Read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Um, let's aim for uh, actual time of, uh, of 11 o'clock. 